Deeg walked up to her door and gently pressed his paw against the touchpad. He knew it was early, but the situation was odd, and she'd told him to inform her of anything. To be honest, he was delighted she was taking her role as security officer so seriously. It was comforting to have a human protecting them, a well-trained human at that, if the few details he'd gleaned of her career before their meeting were to be believed. As the door slid open with a mechanical swoosh, he found the barrel of what the Terrans called a pistol aimed directly at his head. Fear shot through his system. His paws were up immediately. Just me. Just me. He almost shouted, consciously making zero overt movements. He thought to bolt, to make a run for it, but dashing might only provoke its lethal instincts. Their eyes met, and he couldn't help another pang of fear rushing through him. Its eyes were wide, wild even, pupils completely dilated. By all the holy stars. The human, lying in her bed, suddenly came to a realization of the world around her. Quickly, the gun moved in her hand left side facing out towards her captain with the barrel pointed upwards and her finger off of the trigger. The adrenaline in her body calmed. Sorry, sir. Uh, bad dreams. I, I'm so sorry. The issue he'd come to her room with was gone. His curiosity peeked through as his fear calmed. Dream? He asked, doing his best to pronounce the word of a language not quite well fitting for his mouth. The word must have been Terran, as it didn't come through, the translator changed in any way. Without a proper translation, the program will simply leave the word as is in the translated sentence. Yeah, you know when you sleep? The gun was being placed back under her pillow. Plenty of species sleep, but dream isn't a word I'm familiar with. What does it mean? Um, I guess it's... Well, strictly speaking, when a human sleeps, our subconscious organizes and reviews all the extraneous data we pulled in from the day. It organizes and stores everything, or gets rid of it. But in that process, for a lot of humans, we see things, experience things. For me, it's like I'm living in a movie, one I've seen before. Her voice trailed off. Deeg was still working on figuring out which facial movements meant what, but he was pretty sure this one was fear or maybe sadness. Are you okay? Hmm. Oh, yeah. Dreams can just be a bit vivid sometimes. And, well, they're not always good. Some dreams can turn into what we call nightmares. What was your dream about? He asked, still trying to read her face. She couldn't see him anymore. She saw her dream, a memory in all honesty. She could see their faces, clear as that day. The popping, shaking, still rang in her ears. It was, um, well, it wasn't fun. Anyway, what did you need? Her face quickly became a blank, professional look, the one she wore most often. He was beginning to think it was less an expression and more a mask, but he didn't push. He'd been told humans react poorly to emotional support when it's not requested. It made little sense to him, but until he had a better grasp on their species, he wasn't about to test things. Right. Yes, there was an odd signal coming from a nearby debris field. Nothing we'd normally note, but you asked... To be notified of anything, yes. Thank you. I'll join you on the bridge shortly, sir. Just need a minute to collect myself. Of course, I'll see you there. He gave her a nod and as good an approximation of a smile as his species could muster. It was genuine, though and he moved out into the hallway and back to the bridge. Hmm. Dreaming. A collection of extant or to-be-organized data. Does that mean those nightmares are comprised of data the humans find scary? If so, then where was it pulling that data from? There's no way she found any of us scary. What could even scare a human? Suddenly, something she'd said dawned on him. One I've seen before. Memories? His mind drifted to his first memories of her, less a meeting and more an incredible showing of that fabled human strength. Gareth and he had just made port at a way station, 
still seeking an able being to take over as their first security officer. Look, the more cargo we start hauling, the more likely we are to get attention, not just space side, but when we dock or land too. We need someone who can think tactically on their feet and knows how to handle those kind of situations. I know, Captain, and I agree. I just don't think we're going to find that here is all I'm saying. Some podunk go-between isn't going to have what we need. I'm telling you, Gorma Prime, the Gorma are known for their tactical mind and ability to keep cool. Plus, they're the nicest, most polite and professional people you'll ever meet. Sure, and they're only 11 jumps away. Nearly three-fourths of full fueling just to get there. Well, yes. But then we could be certain we're getting someone good. By the void, getting someone at all. Their debate had been going on for some time, and it continued as they searched unsuccessfully around the docks for nearly an hour. Finally, defeated, they found themselves at the station cantina. Both of them were too disappointed to uphold their end of the argument. Both of them sipping on something cheap. Gareth was about to rouse his belabored point when the sound in the bar hiked up sharply. It looked as though two groups were starting to get at each other, mercs of some kind by the looks of them and their patchwork of arms and armor. It seemed that one group had made less than complimentary comments about the brood mother of the other group. The insectoids took offense to this and started to stand. No one speaks ill of the matriarch. Oh, no. Aren't you just a drone or something? Surprised you can get offended. At this point, the barkeeper, brave considering its size, stepped down off their stool and out between the two groups. Unfortunately, his words could barely be heard over the two rowdy bunches, and they all but ignored him entirely. Deeg and Gareth shared a look of concern. If this got out of hand, it could be ugly. They watched the bartender slink past the groups and over to a corner table. Deeg only now realized it sat a single patron, heavily cloaked and sitting next to a large bag. What he had thought was some tall cargo of some kind was actually a creature, and the bartender was mumbling to them. They had to be asking for help. There was a motion from the large thing and then more pleading from the barkeep, followed by the same motion. Seemingly rebuked, the barkeep twaddled back to the groups and attempted once again to defuse the situation. Again, though, they had no success. Less so, in fact, as one of the insectoids palmed their head, sending them sprawling to the ground as he inched closer to the other group. You will take back your words. One buzzed. Or what? came the response. You will pay, replied a different insectoid. The bartender quickly got up and rushed back to the large alien. This time, they were profuse in their begging. The lone being paused for a moment and then made a different motion from the previous time. The barkeeper then stepped a fair distance away and waited. Hey, settle down, came the clear words from the alien's mouth. Unfortunately, it was ignored by the two groups who were nearly at each other's throats and paid no heed to anyone else. You will pay with blood. Are you going back that up, bug eye? Hey, both of you, that's enough. The creature stood, and Deeg's eyes went wide. It had been sitting, and now, standing, it was nearly twice his size. As she pulled back her hood, realization struck both Deeg and Gareth. This was a human, and yet the two groups seemed oblivious to her as their hands started moving for weapons. The human let out what Dag would later come to know as a sigh, an expulsion of breath denoting exasperation or annoyance. For now, though, Dag was more focused on the human fist slamming down onto the edge of their table with so much force that it went flying and spinning up into the air and crashed down with a resounding metal clang. Enough! The human yelled so loudly that some patrons winced in their own varied ways. Gareth's hands shot to his ears. Utter silence. She had their attention now. In fact, she had the rapt attention of every creature in the bar. Both groups went from ready for a fight to seriously reconsidering life choices as the realization dawned on them that a fight now meant going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a human. The first group, 
a motley crew of a number of different species, quickly left the bar altogether. The insectoids stayed, but sat down and huddled silently together with their drinks. Not a one made eye contact with the monster in the corner. Letting out another sigh, the human picked up the table with a single hand and set it right. With her other hand, she grabbed her bag and made to leave with a curt nod to the diminutive barkeep who turned an appreciative hue and did their best to return the gesture. Deeg looked at Gareth with a familiar gleam in his eye. No. Think, though. Not a soul would try and mess with us with a human on board. Respectfully, Captain, you're fucking insane. Penelope walked out of the bar. She'd wanted to keep a low profile and stay out of trouble, but you just don't hit the one who serves the drinks. Common sense. That said, it was time to move on. Hopefully one of the passenger ships would be happy to take her. Some were even willing to waive the ticket fee in exchange for safety, which was good considering she was flat out broke this far from Terran space. She sighed. Is it too much to ask for a nice quiet place? Move some heavy shit for someone, get paid, and be left alone. Gods, that sounds perfect. Oh, and some trees, too. Or at least a good sunset. Is that a dog? Her reverie was interrupted by a stout, three-ish foot-tall creature covered in brown fur. It had a short snout and paws for hands. She presumed feet as well, though it wore shoes. No claws or nails to speak of, however, and its teeth were flat. She'd only noticed the teeth after it started speaking. Of course, we'd pay well and we have quarters that could fit you comfortably. Captain. A second creature caught up to the talking dog, apparently their captain. This one was truly alien to Penelope. The captain she at least had a shaky frame of reference for. It was human-like, with two arms and two legs and so on. The other, however, was pink and blue. Navy blue skin covered by a pinkish kittenish shell, limbs like a prawn that came forward from the torso instead of from the shoulders. It also had an intricate set of pearly frills on its head that it preened periodically. What do you want? She asked as she looked them over. The captain seems to think that with a human as our security officer, pirates would be dissuaded from attempting to claim the contents of our cargo bay to which I tried to inform him that humans don't like to be bothered. Apologies, we'll be on our way. The hiss of a metallic covering on his face punctuated his statement as he attempted to usher his captain away. Look, I don't know about being a security officer. Exactly. See, Cap- But- Shit. I could use some money. Where are you headed? The captain's eyes lit up. We are headed to Roxia. A new colony is starting up, and we've got a good deal to deliver energy cells since they haven't finished constructing their power grid. Hence, our predicament. First pirates that scan the ship are going to see the cells, and... Come running. The human finished. Precisely. Bood, if we make it known that the ship boasts a human for security, you get a good bit of money for basically just existing, and we get to make it to Raxia without incident making our own tidy profit, too. Then we can start taking more and more profitable jobs, which means more money for all parties involved. I mentioned your own quarters as well. Captain Deeg held out his paws. Penelope couldn't deny it. She didn't want to get attached to some freight crew, but it wasn't a bad deal. Raxia sounded perfect, though. A new colony meant a low population and plenty of simple labor. Raxia have plant life. Absolutely. A rare find, honestly. Natural forest and grassland. Breathable oxygen. Not sure. You're not wearing a breather here, so... Perhaps. I could deal with that. Okay, how's this? I will accompany you to Raxia as acting security officer. I'll take my cut, and we call things even there. Penelope offered. Not what Dag wanted but also not a total loss. And with the money from the energy cells, they'd at least have plenty to hold them until they could find a permanent fill for the position. He looked to Gareth, who seemed far more accepting of this situation than having a human aboard permanently. Well, I'd love to have you on beyond that, but I'll take that deal over no deal at all. 
he held out his paw. He didn't know much at all about humans, but Gareth had mentioned this custom in passing once. Apparently, he was doing it correctly as the human extended her own paw and took his making a vertical shaking motion. Humans truly were fascinating. Her paw boasted no fur and comprised five articulated limbs, making them capable of handling a wide variety of objects. Her grip strength was incredible, too. Letting go of the paw, Penelope motioned towards the quarters section of the station. I've got to collect a few things from my bunk, so I'll meet you in... Docking Bay 9, fourth ship from the entrance, and I'm Deg. Penelope, see you there. She made some kind of motion with her right hand, two fingers tapping her brow and then flicking outward. Then she turned and walked off. Well, you've done it, Captain. For good or ill, we have a human riding with us to Raxia. I'm just glad it seems as though that's where we'll part ways. Gareth said, once he thought the human was out of earshot. You really don't like them, do you? I thought it was just nerves at first, but why? Deeg asked, genuinely taken aback. Sir, she's a human. They have a reputation for a reason, and one that they've gained in only a short amount of time. You have a bad habit of letting your curiosity override your sense of self-preservation. The pearly frills of his head shuddered in exasperation. Look, sir, I'm with you as always. You're the captain and the decision ends with you. It's just a dangerous game we're playing now is all. I appreciate the honesty. I've got a good feeling about this, though. I agree, it is a dangerous game we're playing. That's why I hired her. We need some dangerous on our side. Gareth looked back the way the human went. Well, we certainly got that now, sir. After a short pause, they made their way back to the ship to break the news to their crew. You what? was the general call after Captain Deeg had pulled the crew together and informed them that the perfect candidate for security officer had been found at last. The only ones not to raise a fuss were the cargo-loading bot, who wasn't sentient, and Tonit, the Ossian xenobiology specialist, and incidentally the designated cook given their knowledge, who seemed more interested in getting their tentacles on a real live human. Look, I know their reputation as well as you. Gareth and I both witnessed firsthand her capacity in the cantina. However, let's not let rumors and wild stories cloud our judgment. And just think, no pirate in their right mind would dare to intercept us when they read a human on board. I heard they're carnivores, sir. They eat people. Thwill. Their technician spoke up. All foot and a half of him was shaking. Fine gray fur fluffed up. Tonnet piped up. Omnivores technically plant and meat, but the meat doesn't have to be from sentient creatures. Though, strictly speaking, there's no reason it can't be. Tun, you're not helping. Oh, mm hmm hmm Please don't get me eaten, sir. Thwill murmured. No one is getting eaten. Gareth spoke up. The captain has made his decision, and barring a couple of newer faces, we've all been a crew for a few cycles now. He's never lead us wrong so far, and I think he's earned some trust, yes? He looked each crew member over. There was some grumbling, but the general consensus was one of acquiescence. Tonit was practically grinning if Ossians could do such a thing with their beaked mouths. Thank you, Gareth. Now she'll be arriving shortly to meet everyone. I don't expect you all to become bonded or anything, but let's be friendly. If it helps, the deal is just this single trip to the Raxia colony. The human may be intimidating, but let's not be insulting. That includes youth, Will. I understand the instinct, but I don't want to find you hiding in a vent again. Conversations turned inward as some crew went back up into the cargo bay to continue work, while others just relaxed in the interim. Thwill hopped over to Tonnet. Tun, I may just die of anxiety before the human ever gets here. You know, you may actually have less to worry about than the rest of us in terms of aggression from the human. Tonnet was writing on their data pad as they spoke. Why is that? Well, humans are still being studied given their youth in the galactic community, and they are not very cooperative with offering data on their biology and culture, etc. But 
If my research hasn't led me wrong, humans often bond with what is known as a pet. These are creatures they find pleasing for any number of reasons. One of those reasons is... They held up a tentacle for emphasis. Physical attributes. I believe your form fulfills many of the requirements. Fine fur, small size, large ocular organs. Besides, even if I'm wrong on that, you may be in the clear solely from a dietary perspective. Given your size compared to a human, you simply wouldn't be worth making a meal out of. I may be wrong, though. I suppose we'll see. Their eyes gleamed at the prospect of first-hand data on human biology. This did not calm Thwill's nerves. In only a few minutes, not a single crew member missed the approach of the human. Their frames stood far higher than any other on the dock and were given a wide berth. The hood of her heavy cloak was still down, and her two eyes scanned back and forth over the docks. Under one arm was a metal box, and slung over her shoulder was the large bag she'd carried with her at the bar. Deeg set the manifest down and walked over to her. Everything was in order, and he'd added Penelope to the crew complement. Gareth would transmit all relevant data to their destinations. Any pirates to intercept the transmissions would clearly note the new position on the crew data. Security Officer Penelope. Human. Strictly speaking, the crew complement should include more info than just that, but he could get it before the jump, after she'd settled in. We'll be underway soon here, but let me introduce you to the crew. His paw motioned to the open cargo bay of the freighter and the many eyes all trained on her. After the introductions had been made, Gareth had to shoo Tonnet away, promising plenty of conversation later, and led Penelope to her quarters. Following him through the ship, she noticed the tri-jointed legs that the habsuit obscured at a first glance. Her room looked less like a dedicated living space and more like a large storage space that had been cleaned out, but it was clear they'd done all they could to make it workable. My apologies if it's a little austere. We don't exactly have many furnishings to fit such large creatures as yourself. Gareth looked furtively at the human. Not at all, this is perfect. Penelope walked into the room and looked around. There was a small sink in the far left corner of the square room. The rest of the back wall was shelving. A tall storage locker sat against the right wall, and directly from the door against the right wall was a cot that might fit the human. The rest of the room was bare, but clean. Reminds me of... <laughs> she paused, and her eyes darted away from Gareth. Well, reminds me of what I'm quite used to. She finished. Gareth noted an odd kind of what he knew to be a smile come across her face, but he couldn't decipher it. Language was one of his strong suits, but reading expressions was never something he was very good at. Yes, well, um, I shall leave you to unpack. When you're settled, come find the captain and I on the bridge. He turned and motioned to the right, out the door. Take a right and continue all the way to the end of the corridor. Big doors and the like, even you can't miss them. With that, he walked out with haste, and the doors slid shut. Penelope, now alone, took a breath and set to work. With well-practiced movements, she set her bag to the left and carefully placed the metal safety box on the floor underneath the bottom shelf on the far wall next to the sink. Pulling from the box her service piece, she went to her bed and slid it under the pillow. Then she went back, locked the box, and moved to her large canvas bag and began unpacking. After she was finished, Penelope walked to the bridge. The inside of the ship wasn't quite what she was used to. Both the warships she knew and this freighter clearly placed function over aesthetics, but in differing manners. The Basho was austere, organized, nothing was out of place, and everything was up to regulation standards. This ship was lived in. Other crew members' doors were decorated. Someone was growing some kind of purple plants in an alcove, and random things were scattered about. Someone had even removed a service panel from a section of wall, exposing the inner workings of the ship, and apparently walked away. She didn't know quite how she felt about it. On one hand, it grated on her. She spent years having a strict sense of regulation ground into her. On the other hand, it was almost nice to see a bit of color and personal touch to everything. As she came to the end of the hallway, 
The bridge doors slid open. Captain Deeg sat in a chair at the center of the room. A console was attached by a metal arm to the chair, but it was flipped up. Ah, I take it you've settled in? Everything in order? Absolutely. There's even room to work out, which I'm grateful for. She noted the odd look in Deeg's eyes. Work out. I'm not sure the translator is... A human term for exercise, physical training. Gareth explained as he walked over. Correct, Gareth. You've some significant knowledge of Terrans, it seems. Cultural, mostly. A ship's first mate and quartermaster would be remiss not to learn as much as possible about any species we might encounter, especially a species such as yours. Diligent as always, Gareth. Penelope, though, might I ask why one as strong as yourself might need to continue to train their body? Well, partly it's just habit at this point. Military service, human military service at least, doesn't leave a soldier without some learned mannerisms. You live a certain way long enough, and it becomes second nature. But more than that, it's the ship's gravity. The gravity? Dieg asked. The gravity on space stations and ships this far from Terran influence all set their artificial gravity to an average between species norms. She pushed off the floor and landed back down with ease. Earth's gravity is about twice that average. Combine that with human adaptation and you get a loss of bone density and muscle mass because my body recognizes that it doesn't need to waste energy on keeping itself fit for Earth gravity. So I exercise quite frequently to keep that from happening. Deeg was almost as engrossed in the biology lesson as Tonet, who had apparently teleported to the bridge at the mention of Terran biology and was furiously scribbling notes on their data pad. Fascinating now. Let's shift the discussion to the effects of physical damage on a human. You see, I have heard that humans can suffer total loss of limbs and continue living. Is this true? They rattled without looking up from the pad. Tonnet, Gareth said. They looked up. Yes? Still not time. Oh, very well. Later then, I suppose. I'll be in my lab, Miss Penelope. Just out the door and to the right. They responded as they, sulking, left the bridge. Yes, well, on the note of gravity, we can increase the gravity in your room to better suit you. Twice this is about the maximum we're capable of. It's a non-critical system, so it'll be turned off in emergencies and we'll let people know not to waltz into your room carelessly, but there shouldn't be an issue. The captain said as he pulled the console down. A couple of taps and a small readout of Penelope's room came to view. With a couple more taps, he increased the artificial gravity. Looks like this ship has got all the bells and whistles, huh? Penelope said. Another human phrase. Deeg cocked his head to one side, and then the other. Yes, it means... Gareth started. Wait, wait, let me decipher it. Bells and whistles. Noise making? No, no more general than that. Extras. Bells and whistles could be put on as additions to the original object, added for convenience and utility. I see, indeed. Spot on, Captain. Penelope chuckled. Gareth was making some sort of face that must have been his people's version of a smile, somewhat obscured by his breather, as he gave a chuckle himself. I do think, Captain, that our new security officer should get a tour of the ship as well as her station, yes? Indeed. By all means. He waved a paw over to his left, and Gareth moved to a stretch of consoles and screens mounted on the wall. Penelope followed and Gareth explained that these consoles included sensor readouts for the interior and exterior of the ship, control of cameras in the corridors and the cargo bay, as well as a secondary control for their weapon systems. It may have been more accurate to say weapon system, though, as the ship boasted only a singular mortar-style weapon. It was known as an arc caster and wasn't capable of dealing much damage. Its main purpose was simply to overload and disable a pursuing ship before they could get within conventional energy weapons range. Gareth then led her on a short tour of the freighter, a bulky ship, almost three times longer than it was wide. It was built to haul large amounts of cargo. Incidentally, this meant it wasn't exactly fast, especially at sublight speeds. The bridge sat at the forward where two parallel corridors ran down, 
joining once again at the cargo bay in the aft section. The cargo bay took up the most room by far, comprising the back third of the ship. Having run the length of the ship, Gareth moved from the cargo bay, just as Captain Deeg called over the intercom. Attention all crew! Our cargo is secured and preparations made. We will depart shortly. First officer and security officer to the bridge, please. Excellent timing as always. Let's go. Gareth said and started off for the bridge. The ship began to rumble as its engines started up and began departure sequence. Penelope took to her station as the ship oriented itself toward the station's exit hatch and surged forward. Captain? She asked. Yes? I don't believe I learned the name of the ship. Ah, of course. Welcome aboard the Blue Nebula Penelope. There's a bit of a story to the name, but I'll tell you some other time. He smiled knowingly as he made small course adjustments. Gareth. The captain spoke up after a long pause. Go ahead and transmit to our first jump point and inform the Raxian colony that their shipment of cells is in en route. If all goes well, we'll make Raxia in six standard cycles. Transmission sent captain, reading for FTL jump. Gareth responded from his con. Penelope, ship systems check. We're green here, Captain. Uh, ship systems check. Reads nominal. We're ready for jump. She translated. Excellent. Engaging FTL. Oriented to their first destination, the Blue Nebula paused only a moment before blinking out of the system and beginning its journey to Orbos. Sir, a cargo vessel is jumping to the Orbos system. Her manifest reads a significant number of charged energy cells. We could inform our friends there. A tidy sum if captured safely. No. Sir, it would be our biggest haul since... A clawed hand scrolled down to the crew complement and thrust the data pad toward the subordinate. Position, security officer, species, human, age, 31, Terran years, sex, singular, female. A photograph was attached. She's the one from the bar. I'm not sending our crews to their deaths. Let some other crazies go for it. Uh, human. Understood, sir? Penelope dressed quickly. The popping still echoed in her mind, but at least the images were fading with consciousness. She'd have to thank Deeg for his understanding. Not many humans, and far fewer aliens, would be so forgiving when having a gun pulled on them. With a deep breath, she rooted herself in the present and walked out into the hallway. Focus pen. As the doors to the bridge slid open, Deeg had taken his seat, but Gareth was standing at her station. We were halfway to our jump point when the sensors picked up an odd signal coming from the asteroid cloud at the edge of the system. Gareth is at your con checking it out, but can't make much of it. It's too faint. The captain said, Come look. See if you can make frills or webs of it. If I didn't know better, I'd say it was a Terran signal, but that's impossible. This far outside their territory, a weak signal, not an SOS as far as I could tell. It's just odd. Gareth moved from the console so Penelope could have a look. She looked at the waveform on the screen and lifted an audio device to her ear. The faintest repeating sound could be heard. There was interference and the signal was weak but a pattern was clear. There was something familiar about it, though, something she couldn't place. For some reason, an old boot camp memory popped into her head, reading a weapons manual with her squad mates. Why am I thinking of that of all things? Waving the thought from her mind, she refocused on the signal. I think it is Terran, but you're right, Gareth. It's not an SOS, and even a disabled ship's emergency transponder should be far stronger than... Whatever this is. Well, a mystery begs to be solved. Deeg started. Captain. Gareth stopped short as the captain's paw came up. Well, get only close enough to determine what the signal really is. Provide aid if it's needed, but otherwise we can leave a buoy for the... What? The Tinson have a claim of this system, yes? We'll leave a buoy and let them know what we found. Understood, Captain. Shall I change course, sir? 
Tonnet asked, sitting at navigation. Yes, but measured, please. For now, let's just get close enough to clear the signal up and see what we're dealing with. After what amounted to ten Terran minutes, they'd have the distance from the signal source. It's definitely human, sir. Penelope said, still studying the waveform with disbelief. It is an emergency signal of some kind, but not an SOS, and it can't be coming from a UEMC ship. It's too simple to be an onboard AI. Ton, bring us close enough to do a detailed scan of the area, please. Yes, sir. They engaged the sublight engines once more. Again, the distance was halved. At this point, they were moving into the asteroid cloud. It was dense as asteroid fields go, but nowhere near dense enough to pose navigational issues. The real threat was micro-debris flying at high speeds, but the freighter's shields were practically designed to handle such things. Initiating scan of the local area, Penelope said. A high-pitched pulsing sound resounded through the hull and her screen lit up with information. It looks like there's a derelict ship floating along with that cluster of asteroids, 40 degrees. So it is a Terran ship signal? Dag questioned. No, the ship seems to be Tinsen design, and the signal isn't coming from the ship, but from something in its cargo bay. This just keeps getting weirder and weirder. Gareth spoke up. Any other ships in the area? This can't be some kind of trap. Nothing on sensors. And it's a weird trap, isn't it? A faint Terran signal that isn't any kind of SOS in non-Terran space. Most people would just keep on flying, and the ship isn't transmitting any emergency signals either. Life signs aboard? Dag asked. None. I'm getting nothing other than that odd human signal. Honestly, Captain, I think I should go aboard. I'll check the cargo bay and determine what this is. If this is a trap, I'll... well... She looked to see Captain Deeg with clear intention. Fine. But I don't like the idea of you going alone. Gareth and I will come with... Absolutely not, Captain. You cannot be put in danger like that. We have no clue what we'll find over there. Gareth spoke up. Even his frills seemed to shudder with conviction. I have to say I agree with Gareth. The captain's safety is paramount. Well... Deeg huffed. Looks like I've been outvoted. Very well. I'll go, sir. Tonnet piped up. My knowledge may prove useful in uncovering what's happened. Dag simply looked at Penelope. That's fine. But while we're over there, if we encounter anything, you'll both stay behind me and do as I say. Understood? She let her gaze sit on both Gareth and Tonnet for a time. Both motioned in the affirmative. Very well. We'll head to the airlock. Deeg held up a paw and motioned to Penelope. The two of you head to the airlock and prep. I'd like a word with Penelope. Gareth and Tonnet left the bridge as Penelope moved closer to Deeg who in turn leaned in and began speaking quietly. Best bring that firearm of yours if you weren't already. If either of them makes a fuss, you can tell them that it was my decision to keep it under the crew's snouts. Poor Thwill was near a heart attack without knowing you had Terran weaponry, I can only imagine. One of these days you really must explain your people's obsession with such lethal tools, but for now go. With a nod, Penelope left the bridge. She stopped first at her room and retrieved the sidearm and then made her way to the starboard airlock. As she met up with her boarding party, both Gareth and Tonnet had breathers on and Gareth handed her one as well. No breathable atmosphere for any of us, so here. Thanks, she said, as she affixed the metal device to her face. There was jostling as the ships lined up, and the airlock clamp mechanism engaged. With that, the all-clear sign on the door console flashed, and the door behind them slammed shut and locked. Penelope, motioning the other two to line up behind her, tapped the open button on the console. A burst of air hit them as the airlock opened and the pressure equalized. Looking into the derelict ship, it was mostly dark, save for some emergency lights that only lit the floor. The only other lights were flashing red and mounted at intersections or turns in a corridor. Penelope's breather hissed. Stay behind me! She drew her MK-8 from its holster and moved into the corridor. 
Both Gareth and Tonette noted the firearm, but simply nodded, or their species equivalent, and followed behind her. Instantly, they all noticed an increase in gravity. Still light for Penelope, about two-thirds of Earth's. Tonnet was most affected by the change. Gareth seemed to handle it well enough. Increase in gravity? Gareth called out. It's my understanding this is not the Tinsnay norm. Nevertheless, they all pushed onward, turning right out of the airlock and down the corridor. Penelope moved slowly. Each step was measured. Her eyes darted from wall to floor for any sign of a trap. IEDs, false flooring, motion sensors. Nothing. It was silent, too, and yet she could hear her old battle buddy complaining. I'm never going to memorize this whole thing, Pen. Well, you'd better. Drill Sergeant will have your ass if you don't. Besides, look at it this way. Are you ever going to need most of this info? No. But one bit of something in here might save your life one day, and then you'll be grateful you spent the time. Think I'll take that life-threatening situation over the Drill Sergeant. She chuckled. What is it? Tonnet asked. Nothing. Ask me again when we're back at the ship. They'd made it to the end of the corridor, which turned left. There were two closed doors halfway down, and at the end, it seemed to turn left again. I guess the bridge behind the right door. Gareth said quietly. Agreed. Stay here. She held out a hand before moving forward alone. As she made it to the door, she didn't move in front of it. Instead, she sidled up against the wall and tapped the control panel which lit up. It read, Open and Close in Tinsnian. Carefully tapping open the door, opened with a loud whoosh and nothing else. More silence. Same stagnant air. After a short pause, Penelope checked the corners and cleared the room. Empty. All clear. Gareth and Tonnet moved into the room. It was definitely the bridge, but there was no crew. No sign of a struggle. Hell no sign of anything. This place is in near pristine condition save for its utter lack of personnel. Gareth commented looking around. Tapping a panel, it lit up displaying nominal systems. All things clear across the board. It's as if the whole crew just decided to what? Leave? Did they maybe have a second ship and just abandon this one here? Tonnet proposed as they too looked at a systems console. But why would they just up and leave? Penelope asked. I'm not sure. Everything looks clear here. No biohazard warnings, no attacks. Gareth perused the ship's log. It just ends abruptly. Last log is an all-clear transmission sent somewhere assuring that their cargo had been secured. Does it list the cargo? No. That's odd. There's no manifest. Black market traders? Smuggling something? And then just leaving their hall for no reason? Um, Miss Penelope, you said the signal was coming from the cargo bay. Tonnet interrupted. Yay, that's what the ship's scan indicated. Why? Well, there is minimal power drain throughout the ship, which makes sense, except I'm reading a not insignificant amount of power being drained by something in the cargo bay. So, Gareth started organizing the facts. Terran's signal. Not an SOS, but something. And it needs power. There was no attack and no biohazard incident. Something happened, and the crew simply decided to leave their perfectly functioning ship in the asteroid cloud of this system. I think the cargo bay will have our answer, Tonnet said. Agreed. But quick checks of the rest of the ship first. I'm not a fan of surprises. Penelope responded. Gareth pulled up a ship diagram on his console. This shows a main corridor that leads right down the middle of the ship connecting the cargo bay and the bridge in a straight line. We came in the airlock here and followed another corridor that intersects the main one here at the bridge and loops around and meets it again down by the cargo bay. Looks like there are rooms off the hallways here, and this room has got doors on both sides. Penelope motioned to the map. You can go right out of here and Ton and I can go straight. We'll open the doors on this side and keep visible contact with you. I don't like the idea of being far from you guys, but fine. We'll meet where the corridors converge and then see what's in the cargo bay. Don't touch those cargo bay door controls till we're together. Yes, Mom. He responded with a mocking Terran salute. 
You know, I always said if I joined the military, I'd get kicked right back out because I'd tell an officer to go fuck themselves. Lay said as she plopped down on the cot. But... Penn waited for her to continue. Nothing. That's it. Oh, well, I did just pass the engineer's qualifier, and the instructor was an ass, but I managed to contain my sarcasm. How was it? I'm taking it soon, too, and I feel like my head's going to explode. Mac asked. It's honestly not bad. They just like to scare you. Had to deactivate a faulty auto turret, or it might just turn me to Swiss cheese like yay right. They wouldn't actually let something hurt you. Penelope's mind wandered again as she made her way back into the hall. They were good memories, though. There was a desire to sit in them for a time, but she knew she couldn't. Pulling herself from her reverie, she made eye contact with Tonette and Gareth and moved around the corner. As the map had shown, there was a single door on her right halfway down the hall and two doors on her left. Moving slowly, she made it to the first door on the left and tapped open on the panel. The whoosh of the door cut the eerie silence of the ship, and a second later, a second whooshing came from the door across the room. Tonit made eye contact and waved a tentacle. The room was dark, save the few emergency lights slowly pulsing. There were resting pods and crew spaces in the room, but nothing stirred. The echoing sound of the door faded back to silence. Penelope motioned to Tonit to move to the next door and open it. Still, nothing stirred as all the doors to the room were opened. Now closer to the four resting pods, both Penelope and Tonnet could see they were empty. That said, there were signs of habitation. Desks had paraphernalia on them, and there was an eating area that had clearly been used. I'll check the other room and meet up with you guys. Wait for me before you do anything, Penelope said, eyeing Tonnet to stress her point. Of course, Miss Penelope. They mimicked a human nod emphatically. With no neck, it looked more like a shaking of their upper torso, but the gesture was understood. Penelope quickly checked the other room and found more silence and stillness. It was a maintenance room of some kind. Access to main engine systems and other critical systems all hummed quietly. Again, though, there were signs of use, but no life forms present. With nothing but the cargo bay to check, Penelope followed the corridor around to her allies. Nothing. An engine room, but no one there, she said. Well then, let's finally see what this signal is, Gareth said as his hand moved to the door's control panel. Those turrets are no joke, though, Mac. Hell of a piece of engineering. Tonnet had moved over behind Penelope. Gareth, wait. She suddenly realized why these memories were coming back to her. It was too late, though. The first thing to be noticed when the cargo bay doors slid open was the smell. A nauseating stench of death and decay. The next thing to be noticed was a whirring noise coming from the center of the large room. A whirring that terrified the only one who knew what it was the prelude to. Enemy life form detected. Penelope's arm shot forward, grasped Gareth's top right arm and ripped him back out of view of the doors. She felt his shell crack under her grip but it was better than the alternative because just as he left the space, it was filled with lead. Round after round collided with the far wall, leaving a trail of punctures about the height of the Blue Nebula's first officer. The turret ceased firing after the first burst, but the rotating barrel kept spinning, waiting. Its whirring sounded a telltale sign that it was still trained on the precise position Gareth had occupied. Gareth could almost ignore the pain in his arm as shock took him. Penelope still gripped him, almost not daring to breathe. Are you okay? Um, I, uh, yes. He stammered as she picked him up and set him down well behind her and motioned for Tonnet to back up. I believe I know what happened to the crew of the ship, Miss Penelope. They said as they helped Gareth move away. Yeah, Tun. Yeah. What do we do with this? Gareth asked, nursing his cracked arm plate. We hope that this works. 
Penelope responded as she moved back towards the door and holstered her sidearm. She didn't move into the doorway, instead leaning up against the wall just to its side. Recognize human voice pattern. The whirring didn't cease. Human voice pattern recognized. Anti-theft protocol engaged. All non-authorized military personnel will be fired upon. You have been warned. Let's hope it's been a short while since its databanks were updated. Recognize military personnel. Aster Penelope, Captain. Military personnel recognized. Captain Penelope Aster, Special Operations Designation Sila, Active Service, Emergency Identification Code Requested. Penelope glanced back at her companions. Sh this might just work. Emergency Identification Code Alpha, 8, Europa, Epsilon, Crimson, Amber. Emergency Identification Code Accepted. Visual Identity. Confirmation Requested. Penelope collected herself for a moment before standing tall and stepping out into the doorway. Both Gareth and Tonnet winced, waiting for that terrifying sound. And yet, it didn't come. Face obscured. Breathing device detected. Local oxygen levels not acceptable for human life. Retinal scan engaged. Identity confirmed. It is an honor, Captain Siler, requesting the return of this AP debt unit to UEMC custody or the facilitation of this unit's destruction, recommending elimination of two enemy lifeforms detected within scanner range. Its barrel stopped spinning, but turned back to the door where Gareth had been. Penelope moved forward slowly. Unit, recognize command. Shut down. Unit, unable to comply with command. Enemy lifeforms detected within scan range. Shit, don't come in yet. She yelled back out the door. Unit, recognize command. All life forms within scan range are designated friendly. Command recognized. Authority level accepted. Two, life forms designated friendly. Zero, enemies detected within scan range. Command recognized. Beginning shutdown sequence. Penelope breathed a sigh of relief. Thank f Sequence complete. Requesting return of this unit to UEMC custody or facilitation of this unit's destruction. With that, the turret's barrel lowered and it entered a dormant state. Immediately, Penelope moved past the corpses and to the power supply conduit, removing the power cable. Okay. She sighed. You guys should be good to come in. Tonnet's face briefly peeked around the doorframe before immediately withdrawing. Again, they peeked, this time lingering for a short time longer before withdrawing. Finally, accepting that it may be safe to enter, they moved into the doorway. Gareth moved in tentatively after them. With the crisis over, they could all look on the carnage surrounding the now deactivated turret. Seven corpses lay strewn about the cargo bay. Three were in hab suites, while four were regularly clothed. All of them, though, were absolutely riddled with holes. The walls behind all of them were similarly scored with turret fire. The decay had seemingly progressed far enough that their stench even made its way through the trio's breathers. In addition to the turret and the corpses were three heavy metal chests with signage that designated them as UEMC weapons and ammunition crates. Penelope spoke up first. Black market dealers somehow find themselves in possession of Terran military equipment. Ignorant of automated defense protocols, they hook up power to the anti-personnel defense turret, and it immediately eliminates all of them. This leaves them adrift where they'd stopped with no one left to raise an alarm. With power and all hostiles neutralized, the turret sits here doing nothing but constantly transmitting its anti-theft warning because it can't recognize that it's just drifting in space and not hooked up to a defense grid. I wouldn't expect anything less from your kind. Gareth spoke as he looked around at the dead bodies. The defense platform's first act in an unknown situation is to slaughter everything around it. Smart. She did save your life, sir. And it was our people's infernal machinery that put it in danger to begin with. He winced in pain as his arm moved too quickly. While not wrong, I did tell you to wait for me. Penelope retorted. But, sorry about the arm. 
Gareth's frills shuddered in frustration. Whatever. Well, with the mystery of the human killing machine solved, I'll report back to the captain. Ton it see about these poor people's bodies and then report back as well. With a huff, he spun around and marched off down the main hall and turned right towards the airlock. He doesn't mean much by it, Miss Penelope, I'm sure... They trailed off, not knowing exactly what to say. There's no need, Tonnet. He's entitled to his opinions. My people's inclination for violence is as much a topic of debate amongst ourselves as it is the galactic community. He's not exactly wrong, she said, as she looked over the weapons crates. They were fully stocked with Terran weapons and ammunition, as the signage indicated. Tunnet inspected the bodies of the seven dead. A curious look came over them. Interesting. What is it? Penelope asked, as she closed the first crate and moved over to her companion. Well, it would seem that these three... She motioned to the three aliens in hab suits. And these four... She motioned to the Tinzen in normal clothing. Maybe separate groups. In addition to the Habsuits, these three are not Tinsen and seem to have died much later than the other four. But that doesn't make sense. Where'd they come from? Indeed. And remember, the artificial gravity on the ship has been increased beyond Tinsen norm. Perhaps these three did it. It would seem this mystery is not quite solved after... Both suddenly had to steady themselves as the ship shook and then settled once more. They looked at each other with concern. What was that? Penelope asked. I am unsure, miss. Tonnet's central body turned somewhat, and look of deep thought came over them. Wait, we've established that these three are not party with these Tinsena. They are wearing hab suits and have died more recently. At this time, we have two questions. One, where did these three come from? And two, what was that disturbance? They looked at Penelope. I'm not sure I'm following. I'm suggesting that these two questions may have the same answer. The sound and jostling correspond with an airlock alignment and clamping sequence. I believe we have been just boarded by whoever sent these three here. Sh an apt Terran expletive. Tonnet noticed the human's eyes tarry on the weapons crates, but was surprised when she instead stood and moved to the doorway. Can't do anything from here. Follow behind me and we'll see what we're dealing with. If something happens, just hide and stay down. Penelope let out a hollow chuckle. An expression of amusement? Why? Tonnet asked as they moved to the airlock. Well, you wanted first-hand data on human biology, right? It looks like you're going to get it, she said, moving to the door. I see. Not quite what I had in mind, miss. Penelope gave Tonnet a wry smile as she waited for them to take a position behind the lip of the door. Pressing the button, the doors slid open quickly, but no one waited for them in the airlock itself, and the doors to the blue nebula wouldn't unlock until the outer door was closed. As such, the two moved in and again took up positions. Penelope at the door and Tonette behind cover. This time, Penelope waited, moving the side of her head up against the door and pausing for a moment. She then repeated the odd action lower on the door. What are you doing, Miss Penelope? Tonnet asked. Penelope tapped the fleshy protrusions on her head. Listening, there's something mechanical on the other side of the door. How can you... Questions for later. It's most likely a frame. There's nowhere near enough folks turning to piracy to fill a crew so it's not uncommon to see them using mechanical assistance. Great. Really? Robots? A focus came over the human as she motioned for Tonnet to stay down. It almost scared them how her face changed expression. There was no smile anymore, and the eyes took on a deadly seriousness. They shuddered to think of themselves on the receiving end of this aura. Having noted her companion's hidden position, Penelope took a deep breath and opened the door, in an instant, it slid open, and her target was in front of her. A machine about half her height with three leg-like appendages supporting a round body, and atop that, a cylindrical-shaped head. A lens was looking down the hall to the cargo bay before it quickly refocused on the large creature surging forward from the airlock. A small laser weapon deployed from body 
but it had no time to fire as Penelope's left hand gripped its head, lifted it into the air, and slammed it into the opposite wall. Penelope had apparently used enough force to crush the thing's head entirely as its body detached and fell to the floor. The shattered head only remained due to Penelope's grip. Oh, well then, that was... Huh. I honestly thought that it would be a bit more durable, she said, as she looked at the crushed cylinder in her hand and then let it drop to the ground. After a brief moment of shock, Tonnet produced their data pad and began taking notes. Penelope noted that the rest of the corridor was clear and began making her way to the bridge. Bridge first, hopefully, we can get a good idea of what we're up against and where everyone is. Tonnet made a gesture mimicking a nod and followed at a distance. Reaching the turn in the corridor, Penelope peeked around the corner and saw that the bridge doors were wide open. It wasn't a great angle, but she could see one frame of similar design past the open doors. Holding out a hand, she motioned for Tonnet to stay put. Tonnet was again surprised and made note of the near silence with which Penelope dropped low to the ground and made her way to the open bridge door. What was one frame from the angle of the corner revealed itself to be two frames and an alien in a familiar style hab suit. Penelope was used to perfectly controlling her movements in regular gravity, and with the ship operating on half that norm, it was almost nothing to move with speed and silence. She moved past the first frame she'd seen, which was evaluating the security console. Making sure not to alert that frame, she moved up behind the alien and the frame it stood next to. They were apparently attempting to slice the console attached to Captain Deeg's chair. This task was seemingly so engrossing that neither noticed Penelope taking a position directly behind them. In a flash of motion, she grabbed the alien by its hab suit with her left hand and the frame by its head with her right. In one fell motion, she crushed the frame and whipped its body across the bridge into the second frame, destroying them both. She turned the alien's face towards the pile of frame parts and then back to her. Call for help and I promise you that hab suit won't even slow me down. Understand? She said with a deathly growl, staring into its eye. It began to shake in the suit and uttered a single wilting, Yes. Good. Now, you're going to answer some questions for me. Tonnet barely watched where they were walking as they moved onto the bridge, tapping away at the data pad and muttering to themselves. Inquire about limits of superb strength. Inquire about ability to move silently despite size. Inquire about ability to launch objects at speed and with accuracy. They continued as they moved into a corner and sat down. The alien in Penelope's grip noticed Tonnet, but did nothing but shake in fear and wait for the questions. First, how many of you are there? Her tone was cool and controlled. Five total now. Thing on other ship got Maul, Varden, and Aegea. More frames. Me here. Three others should be in cargo bay with your people. Frames too. One left on our ship. Please don't kill me. Cooperate, and I won't harm a hair on your... She noticed it was seemingly hairless. Look, talk and you'll be fine. Deal. It made a gesture that Penelope assumed was equivalent to a nod. Excellent. How many frames? And is everyone using energy weapons? Erm, seven frames and... It seemed to be confused about the second question. Energy weapons. Yes, I am the only one not armed. Last question. You have a means of communicating with your friends? The alien's eye tarried to a belt on its suit. Hooked on it was a small round device. This? Penelope grabbed the thing and held it up. Yes, touch screen, speak. It offered. No need. She responded as she crushed it in her grip and let the pieces fall to the ground. The alien made a kind of buzzing noise as it looked down at the crushed comlink. Now. Penelope continued as she moved to a corner of the bridge. You're going to sit in this corner and do absolutely nothing because you know that if you try anything, there is nowhere you can run that I cannot get to you, yes? It enthusiastically made its equivalent of a nod once again. Satisfied, 
Penelope set them down and turned to her security console. She readjusted its height to suit her and pulled up the corridor cameras and the cargo bay camera. What the little alien had said was true. The corridors were clear. There were three individuals with laser rifles and four more frames in the cargo bay. They'd gathered the crew back by the large bay door and were looking over the cargo. Tonnet, stay here and keep an eye on this one. She evaluated the situation. And come over here. I think I have an idea you'll like. Of course, ma'am. After explaining her little plan, Penelope left Tonnet with the alien who, true to their word, made absolutely no movements save a little shaking. She made her way down the other corridor from the one they'd come through and overrode the locking mechanism on its airlock, ensuring no one would be joining the party or leaving too early. Next, she went not to the door that led to the cargo bay, but the engine room and its many maintenance tunnels. Gareth had just met up with Deeg and had begun to explain the situation when the pirate ship sent a warning signal and began boarding them. Docked as they were, there wasn't much to be done to stop the vessel. They were quickly corralled together with the rest of the crew at the back of the cargo bay. Now I'm not sure if this is your first time, but we're not barbarians. We'll take what we want, and you'll be on your way. No harm done. Simple as that. The leader explained to them. He was a sort of bright yellow and red insectoid, though it was hard to tell under the habsuit. He was just a hair taller than Gareth and sported bug-like wings from his back that the suit accounted for. Gareth wanted nothing more than to yell, I told you so! But he would never admonish the captain in front of the crew. Besides, he had more pressing matters to think about like how to handle the fact that Penelope was currently on board the derelict ship, seemingly with no idea they'd been boarded by pirates. He wasn't sure what to do and couldn't exactly discuss it with the captain, lest their captors hear them. The captain was no doubt in the same position as he looked to Gareth. Unfortunately, neither of them were telepathic. He could attempt to scare the pirates by telling them about Penelope, but then they might be able to disengage the airlock and trap her and Tonnet on the other ship. That would not do at all, and they'd probably think he was just bluffing until they sliced the ship's computers and saw proof of her identity. That said, he was fairly sure that none of these pirates were fond of violence. Most just used the threat of it to get valuables and leave. It was mostly a calm affair compared to what he knew of ancient human piracy. He decided the best thing to do was just talk, but not mention Penelope. He was good at talking, and a better sense of these pirates would serve well. So, what happened exactly? I'm curious. We found three wearing similar habsuits to yours on that ship. A question for a question. I answer that one, and then ask one of my own. Fair? The leader's wings buzzed. Gareth looked to Deeg, who just nodded. Fine. We found that ship not long before you. Knew it was just us in the system, so we checked it out. Sent the three over, and then... Nothing. Dead comms. Life signs gone. Weren't about to just give up on it, and it presented us with an opportunity. We wait for another to check it out, and either they go the same way as ours did in there, and we loot their ship or they figure out whatever happened for us, and we take everything. Ah, so a trap. Just not one set by you. I suppose. But now my question. You are alive, so you managed to survive whatever was on the ship. What was it? What killed my people? Before he could respond, though, a familiar voice came over the ship's intercom. Tonnet. Hello, pirates. This is, um, well, I suppose my name doesn't really matter. Well, I'm here to give you a threat, message, kind of a request, too, to be honest. All three, yes. Anyway, put down your weapons and surrender to the captain. That would be Captain Deeg, the Corval. Oh, gosh, I'm really no good at this. Um, just surrender, 
or else you'll regret it because our security officer, Penelope, is going to do something that I'm, of course, not going to reveal to you, but it's bad, so you should really surrender. Ton it out. The intercom cut out abruptly. What? The pirate leader looked more confused than anything. They're a scientist, not an orator. But you really should consider surrender, because if Tonnet is on the bridge, then Penelope must already be on her way here. You see, what we found was an anti-personnel turret, a human weapons platform. We were able to deactivate it thanks to our new security officer, a human who, if I had to guess, is about to burst through one of those doors. The pirate leader wheeled around and aimed his rifle at one of the doors. Cover the doors! he yelled. The other two aliens and the four frames took aim at the two points of entry. The high-pitched whine of charging laser weapons sounded from all of them. Keep aim. We know where it's coming from, and no personal shield could hold up under all our fire. They held, but nothing happened. Gareth broke the silence. You know, Captain, there's another human phrase I think you'd like. I think even a human would call you batshit crazy sometimes. You know you really should look up some of those terms. Having Penelope hanging around. I suppose I should. Deeg responded with a quizzical look. Silence, you two, the pirate said without averting his gaze from the doors. You really ought to look them up, Captain. He repeated, emphasizing the two words. The captain suddenly understood what Gareth was trying to tell him, and, as covertly as possible, glanced up to the ceiling of the cargo bay. Immediately his eyes shot back down as he witnessed perhaps the most terrifying sight of his life. Even in the grays of his vision he could see, hanging from the crane attached to the tall ceiling of the cargo bay, their security officer. Penelope had apparently accessed one of the maintenance tunnels that Thwill most often used, and followed it to a hatch that led out in the ceiling. She had then, silently, swung her way across the support structure to the crane system that was used to move especially heavy cargo. Now, she hung from it with one arm as she gazed down at the unsuspecting pirates, all of whom were still solely focused on the doors. So that's a no to the surrender, Deg asked. Silence! The bug yelled. The final part of Penelope's plan became apparent when everyone in the cargo bay was suddenly forced down into the floor. The bay's gravity had just been jacked up to its maximum. Ah! One of the pirates yelled as they were completely pinned to the ground. A similar sound came from many as they all struggled against the force. The leader and the other alien managed to stay vertical but were clearly struggling to move. Even the frames struggled somewhat, clearly not built by a species that worked under such gravity. Deeg looked up with disbelief to see Penelope seemingly unaffected, still holding on to the crane with a single hand. She evaluated the situation for only a moment before simply letting go. Her massive form careened downward, taken quickly by gravity. Slam! The resounding sound came as she landed on the floor. Her legs bent as they absorbed the impact. Rising to her full height, she moved with incredible speed. Her hands shot out and grasped the two frames she'd landed between. With a twist of her torso and extension of her arms, she threw them into opposite walls. Still working off the shock, Penelope managed to surge forward and crush another frame under her foot. Its shell shattered as she put her full weight atop it. Finally, the shock seemed to wear off and the pirates began to react. They moved sluggishly, though, their rifles more than doubling in weight. The leader attempted to take flight, but his wings did little more than buzz incessantly, not even lifting him from the ground. Penelope, however, moved with ease. Gareth could almost see relief in her eyes as she enjoyed the time under Earth-like gravity. She dispatched the final frame without much of a show simply reaching down and crushing its cylindrical head in her hand. The leader gave up trying to take flight, and the only other pirate not pinned to the ground managed to levy their rifle at Penelope, who made no attempt to avoid it or take cover. 
the hot beam shot out and struck her center mass. Elation and then terror came over them as they celebrated striking the human only to see the sustained beam was having little effect. Penelope held its gaze as she calmly waltzed forward, ripped the rifle from the alien's hand, and snapped it in half over her knee. Tossing the two pieces to the ground, she just palmed the alien's face and sent them to join their broken toy. With that, she turned to the leader to see something that changed her demeanor entirely. The leader had aimed his rifle, but not at her. Instead, the emitter was pointed at Captain Deeg. A storm came over her face. Stop, or he dies, the leader warned. Now, now. We were playing by a certain set of rules, and I was happy to do so. You left them out of it, and I didn't kill any of you. That was fine by me. But you're about to change those rules. Her hand slowly lowered to the pistol that had remained unused at her side. And I will play by them. You'd risk his life to take mine, the bug asked. Nope. Charge time on those rifles seems to be just over a second. That plus your piss-poor reaction time, and I'm fairly certain I could get off two, maybe three shots before you fire. That's one to disarm you, one to put you down, and one more just to be sure. The bug found only cold certainty in Penelope's eyes as he tried to discern whether she was lying or not. He struggled to keep the weapon steady. The rest of the bay was silent. You're bluffing he said, but wilted under her intense gaze. The question isn't whether or not I'm bluffing. The real question is whether or not you're willing to bet your life on that gamble. I wouldn't. He felt so small under her gaze. His instincts screamed at him that this was no creature to trifle with. Those eyes burned into him, and yet he felt nothing but a freezing sensation in his gut. Don't do it. The rifle dropped to the ground with a thud. Good choice. They only waited an hour for a Tinsney patrol to make it to them. Before he could be transferred, the pirate's leader asked for a moment alone with the human. Would you really have killed me to save him? Only if I had to. That's a yes. Looks like only one of us was lying then. I don't really know what you expected, to be honest. Where I come from, you don't point a weapon at someone unless you're willing to fire it. I don't think I ever would have so many cycles ago. I guess I should have never tried to compete with you Terrans when it comes to this. His wings buzzed. This used to be a professional kind of affair. Not anymore. What do you mean by that? The Tinson peace officer slithered up. Time to go. As the officer took the pirate by the shoulder, he didn't say anything but he held eye contact with Penelope. Even with an alien face, there was a clear idea, a notion that concerned her. The Tinson patrol took the pirates as well as the dead from the derelict ship. They confirmed that the ship wasn't acting under the Unity's orders or the Galactic Federation's authority. As such, the Blue Nebula technically had rights to it as salvage. The matter of Terran weapons on board is concerning, but there isn't really a protocol for such a thing. We would confiscate weaponry normally, but we wouldn't wish to offend our new neighbors by, erm, um, claiming what's theirs. One of the tins and officers hissed. They looked to Penelope as if hoping she would solve the problem by virtue of being a human. Uh... Penelope returned a blank look. And... Their flat head turned to the patrol ship and the dead on board. It's proven to be volatile. Their many eyes flitted between Captain Deeg and Penelope. You know, if I didn't know better... Deeg looked at the officer. I'd say you were trying to drop this problem on us. Of course not. The Unity would never... Terran weapons found smuggled through your territory doesn't smell good either. What's the human phrase, Penelope? It smells fishy. Deeg shot her a look that said play along. That is indeed the saying. I, well, the Unity had no part in this smuggling. The officer seemed to slither in place anxiously. Precisely, and yet some might not understand that. So how's this? For a small fee, 
you had an independent third party deliver the very volatile cargo, very quietly, back to its rightful owners. With our security officer here, we can use... back channels. Do things without too many eyes seeing it. This way you get some favor with your neighbors, but without the worry of anyone thinking things were nefarious. They'll never have been in your people's possession. The officer and Deeg both looked at Penelope. Deeg looked with intention. Um, yeah, of course. I will contact some people who can square this away quietly, back channels, and I'll be sure to let them know that the Tinsney were acting in no way nefariously. Penelope hoped the translator would cover for her poor acting skills. Apparently, it did. Excellent. We'll take the pirate vessel now. Leave a buoy and we will recover the civilian vessel in short order. And for your assistance in this matter, the sum of a few thousand galactic credits can be transferred to the holdings of... They hissed. The Blue Nebula, and given the dangerous nature of certain things, I'd say five thousand is a more adequate fee, um, reward. That is doable, yes. Excellent. Deeg clapped his paws together and escorted the officer to their patrol ship. Penelope waited for his return. Back channels? What the hell are you talking about? I'm not active service anymore. Besides, they could have just returned the crates. There's even a finder's fee. Exactly. And now, we'll be the ones to collect it. The captain winked at her. Did I do that correctly? I was attempting to wink. I... Yes, yes you did. She said with disbelief. Oh, come on, I'm doing this for more than just the credit. This way someone who knows how to handle these things safely is doing it. It's best if we don't have a repeat of what happened over there. He wasn't wrong. If it wasn't the turret, it could be mishandling of one of the weapons crates. This pulled Penelope's mind back to the last few hours. She couldn't get the look of that pirate out of her mind. Captain, could I ask you something? Of course. He said, noting the more serious look on her face. Who was the security officer before me? We didn't have one. Didn't need one. I thought that would be your answer. So let me ask another question I think I already know the answer to. Why hire me now? It's only been a single day and we've already run into trouble. This should be a very rare thing, honestly, but... But it's becoming more common. Yes. He looked at her grimly. I mean, there were always a few groups who were willing to threaten and such. Grab your cargo and let you go, but they were few and far between. Recently, though, there have been a lot more stories of... Why? F His eyes turned down and away from her gaze. Humans. Not intentionally. It's just your people's expansion. You're pushing into the territories they used to frequent and we knew to avoid, and doing it with some significant level of force. Look, I don't blame you or yours. It just means we pick someone up who can deter them. Respond to their bluster with a little bluster of our own, and they won't try anything. Gareth blames us. And how do you know one of them won't try something? Look at what just happened. Gareth is... He just researches cultures a lot, and his own people happen to hold certain opinions that conflict with yours. He can gain an opinion of something and find it hard to let go. And on your second point, I think you clearly demonstrated that no pirate is going to mess with us. I saw the look in his eyes. He was never going to fire. Look, we're all fine. This was a unique situation, and it's not going to happen again. Next time, well, just be able to hail them, put you on screen, and they'll... Fuck off, she offered. Ha, precisely. I'd prefer that. And on that whole weapons thing, I'll take the crates aboard, but it would be a lot to get the turret system over here. Scuttle the ship, let the turret go with it. You'll still get something for it with proof of destruction. I'll be on Raxia most likely when you collect on the crates, but I'll leave a message for the liaison. Make sure you get a good price. She winked at him. He smiled and nodded before turning towards the bridge. Penelope headed to her quarters. She could always think better when she exercised, and she needed to think. She hoped things were as Deg had said, and yet what the pirate had said and how he stared at her gave her pause. Compete? 
she hoped she was wrong about what that might mean. They'd initiated the jump and would be a while in FTL, so Gareth left the bridge intent on straightening things out with their new crew member. As he made his way to her door, he straightened his hab suit and cleaned his frills. He tapped the console by the door, and a chime let the human know she had a visitor. She didn't answer her door, but it unlocked, and her voice came from within. Yes? She said with strain in her voice. Gareth tapped the console once more and discovered why. As the door opened, he saw the human upside down along, but not leaning on, the left wall. She held her enormous weight with only her arms. Slowly, she pushed herself up until her arms were fully extended and then lowered herself until her short hair brushed the ground. Watch the gravity, she said, looking over at the first mate, taking slow breaths as she repeated the controlled motion, up and down, again and again. I, um, right, he said. As he moved into the room, the increase in gravity was significant, and he quickly moved to a chair and sat. You handle it better than most, she said as she continued the vertical push-ups. Yes, uh, she wore simple clothes, and he looked at her for the first time without a cloak or heavy clothing that obscured the human's form. My people hail from a normal planet gravity-wise, but we were deep aquatic for a portion of our evolutionary history. So, uh, we can withstand pressure to a degree. Physical exertion in that pressure, however, is a different matter. He expected a carapace of some kind. With the history of theirs that he'd learned, it would make sense to have natural armor. But no. Instead, the human boasted a dense musculature made more apparent by the physical exercise. It was like steel cording underneath tan skin. He noticed droplets of liquid forming as well. It's called sweat, perspiration. She apparently noted his attention. Humans produce it as a means of staying cool. I see. He understood better now how just her grip could crack the shell on his arm. Did you need something? She lowered herself again, but this time tucked her legs in, brought her feet to the ground, and stood. She truly did tower over him. Yes. I just came to say that I'm not... I don't want it to be said that I'm ungrateful. Tarnit pointed out to me that my... exasperation aboard the other ship was rude. I realize that you saved my life, and I thank you for that. Of course. Look, I recognize that you don't like me that much. I can live with it. I've worked with plenty of people I didn't see eye to eye with. I didn't mean... She faltered, but Gareth held up a webbed hand. I understand. Anyway, I'll be out of your... frills in just over a week's time. Until then, we can just stay out of each other's way. Professional working relationship. That sounds perfect. His frills flitted at the satisfactory arrangement. Oh, and, uh, sorry about the arm. Is it okay? It will heal in time. Tonnet is very talented, and we have suitable covering plates. Thank you for asking. Of course. She said as she placed a number of heavy objects into her bag and slung it onto her back. Gareth moved to the door as she lowered herself, as if she were sitting in an invisible chair with her fists held to her hips. Her stomach and leg muscles tensed, and she began to slowly take a breath in through her nose. Just as slowly, she let it out through her mouth. It seemed as though she meant to hold this position as long as humanly possible. Gareth guessed that that would be a fairly long time, as the door cut off his view of the human. Alvarez's blank eyes watched as Penelope buried her combat knife in the neck of the most recent enemy to come through the nearest door. Obviously untrained, he'd waited to fire a shotgun until she was too close. The hesitation gave her enough time to redirect the barrel and push in. Footfalls behind her at the other door. With barely a thought, she let go of the knife, grabbed the shotgun, and wheeled around while crouching. Two bullets whistled over her head. She held an older model tactical, G-70. Six shells. One fired already, so five left. Ten yards to the doorway. She leveled the barrel and squeezed the trigger. 
He took no more than a few steps into the room and wore no body armor. Red mist. His corpse fell backward against a desk. Penelope racked another round as she closed the distance and moved further out of line with the door. The second set of footsteps tried to peek around the doorframe with a rifle. At that distance, there was almost no spread. Penelope put their left shoulder on the hallway wall behind them. Finally, her eyes opened. Sweat ran down her face, and she pulled her heart rate back down. Slow, controlled breaths helped ground her. She was on the blue nebula. The past was the past again. Taking a deep breath, Penelope sat up and rubbed the sleep from her eyes. What time is it? Pulling her hands from her face. Her watch read, 0400. She'd finally gotten to sleep around midnight. Four hours of sleep. Less than she'd have liked, she still felt tired, but there was no way she was getting back to sleep now anyway. She knew Diag's people needed sleep similar to humans. Gareth seemed not to need sleep. He was always on the bridge, so he'd probably be there now, but he was no candidate for conversation. Maybe Tonnet was up. They were clearly curious about humans, too, so why not pull her mind off things with a little talk of biology? She pulled herself out of the small bed and threw on pants and a shirt and headed right out her door. Hooking around past the bridge, Tonnet's little makeshift lab was right ahead. She gave a light couple of taps to the door and waited. After a few seconds, it slid open, and before her stood the Ossian scientist. Their upside-down face was always disconcerting at first. Upside-down from Penelope's perspective, at least. Almost everything on Earth had their eyes above their mouths, but this wasn't the case for Ossians. Their small, squid-like beak sat in the center of their head with two yellow eyes below it. Even using the word head wasn't really right as they had no necks, and as such there was no clear demarcation between a head and a torso. Squid-like was the closest term Penelope had for the species, but it was a poor analogy at best. They weren't aquatic as far as Penelope knew, and their skin was smooth like a squid, but had extremely fine shimmering scales to anyone who looked close enough. Ah, Penelope, a pleasure. Hey, Tonnet, can I come in? Of course, of course. Welcome to my humble lab. They outstretched a couple tentacles and motioned to the room full of various scientific equipment. Thanks. I knew you were curious about humans, and now that we're not dealing with pirates or anything, I figured a conversation might be nice. Absolutely. I must apologize if I pressed you too much in previous days. I've heard much of your people but had little means of confirmation. And you're quite fascinating biologically speaking. For instance, I'd heard that humans required a longer resting period, but it would seem... Um, that is actually correct. Generally about eight hours of sleep is the norm. I'm just finding it hard to sleep is all. Interesting. Are there negative effects attached to sleep disruptions in humans? I would imagine so. There can be, yeah. Total sleep deprivation can have some serious mental and physical consequences. A day or two is not so bad, even for your average human, and I've been trained to stave off its effects. Any more than 48 hours straight, and you start to create real problems training or no. You know, rest assistance is one thing I help a few crew members with. I'd be happy to do the same for you, but I'm afraid I'm uncertain what kind of compounds would work. They sat down in a chair and offered a cleared table to Penelope. I've heard melatonin helps people get to sleep, but it can also make dreams more vivid, which is where my issue resides. It's no problem, though. I get enough sleep to function. It's not like I'm going days without. She sat on the table, which was more a bench to her size. Interesting. Eight Earth hours, you said, is the norm. It would seem your sleep requirements match your size in terms of divergence from galactic norms. They jotted down a couple of notes, but generally kept themselves more engaged in the conversation than in note-taking. Really? I noticed Gareth keeps to the bridge quite regularly. Dieg, I know, sleeps, though. And your people. Gareth's people require rest, but not sleep as you would think of it. Rest he can accomplish while keeping busy on the bridge. 
Corval like Deeg do go into an unconscious state for one or two of your Earth hours. The Corval have a number of subtypes, though, and rest requirements actually vary quite widely between them. I see. Ossians. They pressed a tentacle to their own chest. Do require rest, but only in short bursts. What would amount to five or so of your minutes every six or so of your hours? Huh. I have to admit I'm curious about your species, though perhaps not quite as curious as you are about mine. You're very far removed from anything I'm used to on a human planet. How so? Well, take the captain. Strictly speaking, I'm sure his biology works very differently and for different reasons than a dog. But he looks quite similar to a dog, so there's a familiarity there, even if it's not deserved. Thwill, too, even if I haven't been able to see much of him in the past two days. It seems he's avoiding me. But you and Gareth and most of the rest of the crew are... There's no frame of reference. It's to be expected. You inspire much of the same feeling in myself, and probably the others. Take no offense from Thwill's actions, though. He's skittish, even by galactic standards. Honestly, that feeling is part of why I love the study of xenobiology. On a single planet, life all evolves together, and as such, there's interconnectedness. But the differences between life forms that have both evolved completely, truly separate from one another, is fascinating. That's actually a question I've had since Deeg mentioned it. How does a xenobiologist find themselves on a freighter? Ha! That's a hell of a story, actually. Tonnet emphasized the use of the human phrase. The Blue Nebula is technically my ship, all things considered. You may have noticed its Ossian design. It was originally a science vessel under the Principality, my people's government, and I was head scientist. We were sent to a nebula, close to a new Ossian colony, to research some interesting readings in its composition. Quickly after entering the nebula, though, we lost all power and were left stranded. Emergency life support wouldn't last long. Turns out something in the nebula reacted poorly to the shields and started rapidly siphoning power. Thankfully, a certain curious Corvul came along in a jump ship with exactly two other crew members, Twill and Gareth. Twill recognized the issue with the shields and figured out a fix and we were saved. The mission wasn't going to continue at that point, though, so we all headed back to Osea Prime. And in thanks for saving us, the Principality offered Deeg the ship. Well, if he was going to be jumping around and encountering a ton of different species, I figured I could just stay aboard and conduct my research. So they refitted the ship, I kept my lab, and now Deeg has something better than a jump ship for hauling cargo. But how did the name Blue Nebula come up? Penelope asked. Well, the nebula, to you or me, would look a bright purple from a distance, but Deeg's people can't see that section of the electromagnetic spectrum. They're limited from yellow to blue. To him, the nebula looked at best a dark blue, I would think. I would correct him, but he just kept saying, the blue nebula, and it just stuck eventually. He does have a stubborn streak to him, doesn't he? Penelope chuckled. Indeed he does. They responded. Well... You've answered a question of mine, so it's your turn. I'm open to anything. Just know I'm no expert, even though it's my own biology. Understandable. Hmm, okay. Your people have made a name for themselves in a short period of time, not just for size, but for strength as well. I've personally seen you crush a frame's cranium. They're not built to be indestructible, but they're made of durable materials. What are the limits of that? That's an interesting question, actually. Humans are far from the largest or strongest animal on Earth. Though, compared to all life on Earth, even excluding microbiotic life, we're amongst the largest, to the point we're considered megafauna. So I guess we shouldn't be surprised most alien life is so small. Statistically speaking, the chances are just higher for one of a few million small life forms to evolve intelligence than it is for one of a few thousand larger life forms. I suppose, they said as they pondered the math on that. As for our strength, as far as I know, that's a matter of gravity, and it's been a significant issue for humanity, and one we discovered very early in our progression to space and interstellar travel. 
I wouldn't call us a physically strong species as much as I would an adaptive species that adapted to a significant gravitational force. We evolved in Earth's gravity, but as we left, we realized that without that pressure, our bone density and muscle density would deteriorate. There were a number of solutions. Physical activity, never staying off Earth for too long, ships built to simulate gravity with centrifugal force. Eventually, we figured out artificial gravity. For instance, though, how much weight can you lift? Keep in mind, I'm ex-military, so I'm definitely above the average human physical fitness, but on a good day, I can deadlift 150 kilograms in Earth gravity. Tonnet? I... I think the translator's conversion might be off. You said 150 kilograms in Earth gravity. Uh, yeah? That's... That means in normal gravity, you would be able to lift perhaps twice to three times that? Normal for you, I suppose. Walking around the ship for me feels almost like I'm floating tone it. That's incredible. You know that you could, with little effort, pick up one of those energy cell containment units, right? Not if it was in Earth gravity. No wonder you were able to crush those frames. They must have felt like nothing to you. When you said they would use robotic assistance, I did expect something a little more durable. Yeah. Well, I would encourage you to be careful when interacting with the crew, you might... Oh no, Gareth. You could have ripped his arm clean off. Yeah, I did my best to be gentle, but also... Auto turret. All things considered, yes. I believe you made the right choice. I can heal a cracked shell. I don't think I could have fixed whatever that thing would have done to him. Hmm... You know that raises another curiosity I have with Ossians. You're the only one I've ever met, and the crew seems to refer to you without gendered pronouns. Are Ossians asexual? Do you just have no concept of gender in your culture? Maybe it's just a mix-up with the translator. Tonnet flashed their version of a smile. It's a somewhat complicated subject. Yes, we do reproduce sexually. In fact, my people have seven different sexes or what you would refer to as a sex, their biological role in the creation of an offspring. What? Indeed. Look, we find your lack of different sexes to be quite confusing, as well as your lack of a simple biological process to transition between them. You're telling me you can just transition as you like between seven different sexes? Penelope had to consciously close her mouth. Quite easily, in fact. As you see me now, my skin is purple hue, yes? Yes. Well, that's how you can tell the sex of an Ossian. Currently, I cannot provide genetic material, nor carry an offspring, nor produce food for that offspring. I have no reproductive organs. If I chose to, I could induce a short metamorphosis within my body. The only outward change would be color. Inward, though... I could grow one of three different organs for providing genetic material for the creation of the offspring. I could take on one of two different organs for carrying that offspring to term. Or I could grow the organ that produces the food for an infant after it's born but before it can take in nutrients on its own. That is insane. Your binary spectrum seems quite insane to us, especially vulnerable. Vulnerable? What do you mean? Well, what if, say, half of a given population was wiped out, but it happened to be predominantly males? I think I'd be fine with that, honestly. Penelope gave a wry grin. Jokes aside, it would take generations for you to recover, and there'd be issues with genetic variability, I would imagine. If the same thing happened to an Ossian population, we could recover our numbers in a single generation. I suppose so. The ability to change your sex as desired would have made human history a bit simpler, perhaps. Indeed. This process takes how long? A day or two. I'll probably be going through it sometime soon. It's generally held as healthy to transition a couple of times. Some health issues have a higher chance of surfacing if one doesn't for too long. Which would you choose? I'm not sure. It really doesn't matter too much as I have no intentions of producing an offspring right now. I've been capable of carrying a child before. I believe that's the female's job by your standards. 
but I've also been the second means of providing genetic material which I think you'd consider more male? Your binary spectrum really doesn't translate well. I would guess not. Oh, you know what? I came into possession a fair bit ago of a, and I hope I'm saying this correctly, coffee beans? A human food, yes? Coffee? Oh, thank the stars. The bean itself isn't a food, really, but they're often ground up and soaked in hot water. This creates one of the most popular drinks in human history. I would like to try this drink. Tonette immediately got up and made for a cabinet. It has a lot of caffeine in it, and I'm not sure what else. I really don't want you poisoning yourself. We're in a laboratory. There's no need to worry. I'll screen it for toxins. You, however, will be in charge of the creation. Okay, then. I need a way to turn the beans into powder, a filter, hot water, and cups. Excellent. Tonnet quickly learned that coffee was not harmful to Ossians in small quantities, and after it had cooled significantly. This didn't matter much, however, as coffee ended up being an acquired taste, Tonnet was fine not acquiring. Nevertheless, the two spent the rest of the early morning in conversation good enough even to clear Penelope's mind of the nightmares she'd woken from. The small ship waited until the freighter moved off a distance. The Tinson ship's engines had been set to overload, but the small window had pleasantly presented itself. Move within 3,000 meters of the vessel. 3,000? Oh, understood, sir. The engines are... I'm aware. Continue. Yes, sir. We only need to get close enough to grab the data off the turret systems. Yes, sir. The ship came to just within minimum safe distance of the derelict Tinzen vessel. Stop! Stopping. The man tapped the strange technology. Paul could see the screen, but their translator refused to translate the Terran words. And boom! Link successful! Data transfer! A small bar filled green on the screen, and after a few seconds filled entirely. Complete. Move us off. Reversing course. Paul sighed with relief. The small ship trailed off further into the debris field where they'd hidden themselves. After only a minute, their sensors lit up with the destruction of the Tinzen ship. Hold here and fire up the transmitter. He needs to see this. Yes, sir. Paul pulled the ship's thrust down until they were floating with the rest of the space debris. Moving over to the transmitter screen, they turned it on and pinged home. After a short delay, the connection was established and text came across the screen. Again, their translator refused to translate the words. The humans could read them, though. Connection secure. Report. Shipment lost as previously reported. Ship scuttled. Data recovered from link with defense turret before destruction. Logs are as expected save for final. Logs read interaction and shutdown sequence initiated by... Yes? One Captain Scylla. That's Penelope Astor of... Interesting. Return to home base, Arthur. You've another assignment. Heard and understood. Unfortunately, we couldn't grab those toys at... It's no matter. It won't slow things down. Connection lost. Penelope downed the last of her coffee. No cream and no sugar, but it tasted like the best cup of coffee she'd ever had after all this time. Months without the common items you take for granted will do that to you. And the further she'd gotten from Terran space, the less common those common things became. This has been honestly delightful, Tonet. I appreciate it. Of course, Miss Penelope. You and your species are truly fascinating. Back at you and please. Friends call me Pen. You honor me. They didn't want to press, to overstep, but... Um... I have a question about your name, but I wish not to offend. Penn could guess where this was going. The machine. It referred to you by another name. They spoke slowly, measuring her reactions. Scylla. Penelope finished for them. Yes, if you don't wish to. They sputtered. You're fine, Tonnet. It's a... a moniker of sorts.
an earned name that many of those who served in the capacity that I did would earn or give themselves. Scylla is a reference to an ancient human epic. My name, Penelope, is also a reference to that same myth. I suppose they thought it fitting in some way, but suffice it to say that friends do not refer to me by that. I see. Well then, Pen, it was a pleasure to sit and talk. I hope we can do it again? They asked tentatively, hoping that their final inquiry didn't just ruin the burgeoning friendship. I'd love to, and you've only got me for five or so more cycles, so ask your questions while you've got me. She smiled as the Ossian accompanied her to the door. I don't think I could stop myself if I wanted to. Tonnet chuckled. Penelope had to duck slightly as she exited Tonnet's lab and only paused a moment as the door closed behind her. There wasn't much need for her presence on the bridge, and something else did need her attention the three crates that currently sat in the cargo bay. She quickly set off down the hallway and through the bay doors. A few crew members were working with the loader frame to reorganize some of the cargo. They were clearly keeping their distance from the weapons crates, though. She gave them an awkward wave as if to say, No need to worry. They don't explode randomly and I'm not going to do anything. Just checking them. The crates were marked with the all-too-familiar blocky white lettering. The signage was, as she noted back on the Tinson ship, weapons and ammunition. The first crate was as expected. She popped the latches and lifted the lid to find a row of 15 standard issue, TAR-22, 45 empty magazines, and enough ammunition to fill each magazine twice. Nothing in the crate had been touched. Guess they hooked up the big shiny turret before they messed with these. She closed the lid, relocked the latches, gave it a quick tug just to be sure, and then moved to the second crate. This one read the same as the first, with the exception of the final number in its ID tag. The first ended in a 45, this one in a 46, and the third in a 47. This indicated that they were, at the very least, stored together and thus from the same place. How they came to be on a smuggling ship and where they were headed was still a mystery. Nevertheless, tucking that question in the back of her head, she popped the lid of the second crate, but did not find what ought to be inside. This crate was labeled the same as the first, and yet it contained no firearms nor ammunition. Instead, it contained gear she was more than familiar with, a pressurized full-body all-condition suit and its corresponding armor pieces. Staring at her was the visored helmet with built-in breather and, she guessed, heads-up display nearly indistinguishable from her own, save the lack of personalization and wear and tear. This was wrong. Everything about this was wrong. This wasn't your standard-issue body armor. It was a full set of the gear she would have set up in her locker in the mudroom. In fact, as neatly as it was placed in the crate, she bet she could have it on in under a minute with a salute ready for the CO. She was never faster than a Wally, but he was a freak of nature and didn't count. Her hand drifted to the helmet, fingers pushing across the harsh gray metal exterior. She picked it up and looked at her own reflection in the blue-tinted mirroring of the visor. How the hell did you get here? She quietly asked the woman looking back at her. The hair of the face in the reflection was longer than her own. But it wasn't, of course. It was just unusual to see herself with hair longer than an inch. The helmet would still seal, but her dirty blonde hair certainly wasn't regulation anymore. A soft, warm feeling bloomed in her chest. She couldn't remember the last time she'd done anything outside military regulation. It was small, but the hair sat as a reminder of sorts that she wasn't there anymore. She was as far from Terran space as she'd ever been and got further still by the minute. And yet, and yet her eyes unfocused on her own reflection, back to the helmet itself and the armor and the crates, and she came back to reality. These aren't supposed to be here, not the weapons in the first crate, not the special operations gear in the second crate, and her eyes shifted to the third crate, Tentatively, she placed the helmet back in its snug place and closed and locked the second crate. She moved to the third, marked the same as the other two, sealed the same as well. 
She popped the latches and slowly lifted the hinged lid. Packing material. Sliding the foam material up and out, she found another all-too-familiar piece of equipment. A Hawk D system. A high-altitude, all-weather controlled descent system. Everyone pronounced it Hawk system, though, because soldiers like to have acronyms that sounded right. To be fair, Penelope was pretty sure the eggheads tried their best to make the acronym look like Hawk, but just couldn't get it quite right. It, too, was untouched. A series of devices designed to attach to the wrists, ankles, and lower back. They each contained just enough fuel to slow a person down for a relatively safe landing. Though, Penelope had become known for conserving fuel enough to make use of the device for fast movement in combat situations. The crate contained a single extra set of the tiny fuel canisters. Penelope took a step back. Here it was as if someone had gift-wrapped her own locker back aboard the Basho and delivered it to her. The only difference is they'd cleaned off the paint and dirt and somehow buffed out the scratches and dents. She needed to talk to Deeg. Now I'm no expert on those facial expressions, but you've got the same look as when you pulled that gun on me, so I'm guessing this isn't good. As if she'd summoned him, he was standing behind her. She carefully placed the packing material pack in the crate and closed the lid. Not a soul touches any of this stuff. It's not volatile, but... Dieg, this isn't just a few simple weapons crates. This is advanced hardware, and the only thing that scares me more than finding this along with an anti-personnel defense turret is the terrible things someone could do with them if they'd gotten their hands on it. You have any theories? Twenty, and counting, and none of them are good. Dig with this armor and these guns. Not to insult, but personal shields are for your little energy weapons. They're cute, but a rifle round goes straight through them. Meanwhile, this armor would take a minute of sustained laser fire before buckling, not to mention the implications of this stuff even being here. This isn't the type of stuff that just gets lost crate and all. She looked over at the other crew members in the bay. They'd stopped working and their various eyes were trained on her and the captain. All right, enough gawking. Back to work. Dag waved a paw, and the crew meandered back to the loading bot. For now, we need to get these energy cells to Raxia, but then we head for Terran space and return this stuff. Till then you have full say over it. No one touches it, and we store it separately from everything else. If you want, I'm sure the crew here could use your help with organizing things, we're trying to make space for other supplies we might pick up for the colony. That way you can get to know them and keep an eye on our... surprise cargo. We? We make for Terran space? Look, I'm happy to help out around here, but I'm done once we get to Raxia. I'm staying there. That was the deal. Penelope, you can't just leave this. He gestured towards the crates. Look, I'm sorry, but I'm done. I want peace and quiet. I'll leave you with a hollow recording explaining everything. Totally official, they'll take it, and you'll get paid, but Raxia is it for me. Fine. I can't force you, and I wouldn't, but what about the implications you mentioned? That's for internal affairs to figure out. I'm not active service, and even if I was, that wasn't my job. They'll take care of it. I... okay. Deeg held his paws down and out in defeat. He wasn't sure how she could just wash her paws of this, but he wasn't about to start an argument. He could see her expression hardening. She would fight this. What was their expression? Tooth and claw? For now, if you could stack these in the corner here. We'll cover them and keep one of the bay cameras trained on them. Okay, she said, facial expression softening once again. As he left for the bridge, Penelope effortlessly hoisted the crates on top of one another. No, Pleur, have it... No, no, no. I'm telling you, have it stand there and pick the... I'm telling you, that won't work. It's faulty, remember? The third arm doesn't work right. It won't be a... Yeah, it will. I'm looking at it. It won't. It will. Fine. The loading frame moved to the side of the containment unit and clamped onto the supports. As it attempted to shift the weight, however, the socket of its third arm began grinding and its grip released. 
Without all three arms supporting the unit's weight, the energy cells slammed back into the floor with a clang. Don't say it! But I did tell you. Well, I thought it would be okay. How was I sup- SM quieted as she noticed a shadow move over her. You guys need any help? The human asked. Gods, you're big. Deeg had made it clear to the crew that eye contact and such direct attention wasn't a sign of hunting or intent to attack, but it was still unnerving to have the large thing's two eyes bearing down on her. Not only that, but she'd had the misfortune of seeing this thing in action. Terrifying. Though the eyes and face were different now, so maybe that was a good sign. Only two appendages to stand on. With how thick they were, it was no wonder the humans stood upright. Well, we're trying to move the cells, and the loading bot has enough trouble with their weight as they are, but its third arm's got something wrong with it, so... Plur answered for SM, as it was clear she was distracted. Yeah, a uh, stupid thing managed to mess up a socket or something loading them. Gotcha, Penelope said, looking from the two crew to the robot. They were tiny creatures compared to her and the frame. She'd noticed that most of the crew were closer in size to Twill than Deeg or Gareth. The one named S.M. was about as large as a house cat, and Plur wasn't too much bigger. What? Plur asked. I'm sorry? What is gotcha? Oh. She chuckled. She thought the translator would have picked that one up, but apparently not. It's a mashing together of the Terran words got and ya yeah, or you, as in I've got you, I understand. I can move this, though, if the frame is having trouble. They're pretty heavy. I mean, the bot's built for this, and even it... SM stopped short as Penelope stepped to the unit and gripped its top with one hand. Tipping it up, she crouched and placed her other hand underneath it. With a secure grip, she lifted it up, resting it on her shoulder. Where do you need it? She asked. S.M. stared blankly at the human. Uh, over, over here. Plur waddled over to another set of containment units closer to the bay door. Penelope followed and stacked it atop another. Tonnet was right. They were larger and heavier than her weapons crates, but nothing crazy. The main trouble in lifting them was honestly bulk more than weight. Would you be able to get the rest of these? S.M. asked. Sure. It only took a few minutes before the Bay crew had all gathered to watch the small spectacle. She didn't love crowds, but something about them made Penelope want to show off a bit. She hoisted one above her head by its supports and did a few reps as she walked it over. With another, she did a few squats before putting it back down. Few of them smiled like humans, but they were all clearly enjoying themselves. Various oohs and ahs came with each new trick until the work was done. What's the heaviest thing you've lifted? One of the crew asked as she placed the final unit down. Well, that depends. I was on a battleship once, and a buddy was trapped under some debris. Dunno how heavy exactly, but I nearly cracked a tooth. In normal conditions, I'm not too sure if I'd be able to lift one of these. She tapped the metal casing of the unit. The crew collectively balked at those so-called normal conditions they'd had the pleasure of experiencing for a few minutes the day prior. Why'd you almost crack a tooth? Another asked, looking wearily at Penelope's mouth. I was clenching my jaw too hard, and with all the adrenaline pumping, I didn't realize it. I'm sure most species have something similar, right? It's a tense situation, so your bodies do what they need to to get out of danger. Moderns don't. A small, gray, but plump alien spoke up. Well, my people do. It's for running, though, not lifting heavy objects. Was that a large concern in your people's history? S.M. piped up. Not exactly. Strictly speaking, it makes us stronger and dulls pain so we can fight off a threat better. So inadvertently, yeah, it helps lift heavy objects. Though it also helps us run if fighting isn't an option. I mean, I don't care how strong you are. A bear is a bear. So, your people aren't the apex predators of your planet? We're one of them, sure, but we certainly aren't the biggest or the strongest, or the fastest, actually. We are the most intelligent, though, and damn if we aren't persistent. What is a bear? Another asked. Hmm, 
How to describe a bear? They vary, but in general, imagine something two or three times my size, four times my weight, and five times as strong. They've got furry brown hide that can shrug off knives and such, and if you're close enough to be stabbing it with a knife, then you're already a goner because they have massive claws and teeth. But with that size, they must be pretty slow, right? Oh no, they are astonishingly fast. Powerful legs and all that weight turns into a ton of momentum once they get going. Oh, and they are very good climbers too, so no hiding up a tree. The gathered crowd was almost stunned into silence. A few had doubting looks on their faces. How are your people even alive? Well, they're generally not aggressive to humans. Leave them alone, and they'll leave you alone for the most part. Unless one is starving for some reason, there were far easier meals than a human. Just stay away, and don't threaten their cubs. Definitely don't threaten their young. That's a death warrant, because they will go out of their way to end you if they think you're a threat to their young. They sound terrifying. Honestly, they're kind of cute. Don't get me wrong, I wouldn't go within a kilometer of one, but they've got little ears, and sometimes they sit on their butts like a person. It's adorable. The crowd watched in horror as Penelope mimicked pinching a bear's face. They were starting to think that Tonette's assessment of what humans find cute might be flawed. Nevertheless, the crew were all enthralled by the humans even the doubting ones. After some time talking of various outlandish earth animals, one of the doors slid open, and in its frame stood their captain. Pen will be exiting FTL shortly. Understood. She got up, realizing only then that she'd actually sat on the floor with the rest of the crew members. She made her way to Deeg, and the two started towards the bridge. I see you're getting to know the crew. Diag grinned, if you could call it that. A little, yeah. I was telling them about bears. You'll have to regale me some time as well. I've actually got a few questions. Tonnet was just telling me of the difference in how our two species sleep. Deeg was still debating asking her about this whole dreaming thing, but his curiosity was eating at him. I'd be happy to. Funnily enough, bears actually have a very unique way of resting, too. Another time, though, are we expecting anything dropping out of FTL here? Her face changed again, from relaxed to serious. Not particularly. We're only one jump from a fairly significant trade station. We'll actually be stopping there. The deal is only for the energy cells, but new colonies need all sorts of resources. They'll be eager to buy other things if we have them. Also, we've got to get that poor loader bot fixed. We hired you as security not for loading cargo. I'm sure it's not exactly what you had in mind when you came aboard. I honestly don't really mind. This is all pretty simple stuff comparatively. Daig wanted to push on that. Comparative to what? But he didn't later. I appreciate it, but we should still get the frame fixed. The two walked onto the bridge. Gareth moved from the captain's chair to his station, and Dag took his seat. Penelope went to her station, again readjusting the displays to her height. As the ship dropped out of FTL, a few signals came up on the scanners, other freighters on the far side of the system, and a Tinzen patrol. No odd signals or derelict ships this time, Captain. Penelope relayed. Thank the Loman. Gareth remarked as he groomed his frills. Oh, don't be like that, Gareth. Dag laughed. Ping the Tinsen patrol and let them know what we're about. Then bring us to the jump point. Already transmitted our information, moving us to the jump coordinates. Gareth would grumble, but they both knew he meant little by it. Tinsen and patrol transmitting an all clear were good to go, Penelope called out. Excellent. It took only a few minutes on sublight engines to get into position. In a second, they were back to FTL travel. Hey everyone, hope you loved the video. Don't forget to give it a thumbs up, hit subscribe for more awesome sci-fi content, and now you can also show your support by hitting the thanks button at the bottom of the video. Your generosity goes a long way. Additionally, if you're feeling extra generous, check out our Ko-Fi page to support the channel. Every bit helps us bring you more stories from the stars.
Thanks a bunch.